Hello again, everybody. Time for another episode of Michael's Record Collection, and I am joined by Joel Craig today, the former host of the very popular internet radio show called Interstellar Overdrive to talk a little Pink Floyd. Joel, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Mike. It's good to see you. It's been it's been a long time. It's, it's been, been a long time. It's been ages, just it literally has been. ages. But uh, yeah, it's good to see you. And I figured if if I'm going to talk about some Pink Floyd, and you know Roger and Dave aren't getting on the call, no, <laughs> you're the guy I want to talk to. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. So your show was on the dividing line when uh, when I started at the dividing line. We started right, pretty much right around the same time. I think you might have been a little before me. And then we both moved to progrock.com. Both of our shows moved there. We did, yeah. But uh, what, was the, what was the impetus for you starting that show originally? Um, I was I – w- I mean, I grew up a Floyd fan, so um... – my musical um, interests and likes always tended toward the more, um, oh, how shall we say, David Gilmore influenced guitar playing and just more more melodic. I, I was, you know, I, I I like Genesis, but they weren't really my my favorite. I I was a bit of a Yes fan, but. Um, my mom always yelled at me when she heard John Anderson singing, so I always had to turn <laughs> that down. But for some reason, she tolerated the Pink Floyd, so I got I got away with um, listening to uh, Floyd at, at very um, unhealthy volumes um, while I was still living at home. So um, I just they were just always one of my favorites. So um, I, it's funny I I was. Um, reading some news uh, yesterday or two days ago when it was the 20 some anniversary of the original iMac and my first computer was the upgraded version of the original iMac so I had the gray one with the uh with the 128 megabytes of RAM and (laughs) and whatnot but one of the first things that I did was you had real player back then and yeah. there was it was kind of the infancy of streaming audio and stuff and i was i'm like i want to hear some prog rock i want to see what's out there you know so i started discovering all these bands through this dutch internet radio station that i was listening to on real player like you know you know if you could get through the buffering every few seconds you could hear some good music so I, I was listening to that. And then progrock.com was out there from like 99 or so. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the stations I gravitated to and was discovering all these new bands. And I always tend to gravitate toward the ones that were more influenced by um, Pink Floyd, bands like RPWL, um, mm-hmm. early Porcupine Tree, you know, that kind of thing. So um, why I started the radio show, I got hurt in a construction accident and I wasn't working anymore and I was bored. And so <laughs> I started listening to shows and, and one of them, uh, one of the stations was a dividing line and that was a very interactive platform, had the chat room going, made some online friends and stuff. And then after a while, I thought, I can do this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I sent in a, uh, like a demo and and sean was like hey you're actually pretty good at this um so started doing a show you came along right around then uh mark and reyna who run progrock.com now um who live really close to me actually um they were there in the early days and we kind of formed a neat little community um around doing these silly little radio shows and then you know it was the not only the infancy of, of streaming, but then podcasting started and we were doing podcasts before they even had a name for it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And that kind of grew, you know, I mean, we had people listening all over the world, made friends, got together at music festivals, all that kind of thing. So that was kind of how it started. Mm-hmm. Um, I did it for five years. Um, and I just kind of got a little burned out on it. You know, there's a couple couple incidents which we don't really need to go into yeah. here, but I just kind of it was time. It was time yeah. to let it go. But you know, it's funny. I I still hear from people 
you know, I mean, that was 2008 when I quit doing it. I still hear from people, when are you going to do the show again? When are you going to do the show again? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, I'm 60 years old now. I just turned 60 a couple months ago. Like, I don't know if I have the energy <laughs> to do it. But I, you know, I still listen to stuff online and, and still still discovering new bands, you know, here and there. Airbag is one that I really love. And, love them. And Bjorn Reese's solo album is fantastic. And he does the... He does the uh, what's the the Gilmore related um, website that he runs or a blog um, Gilmore ish or I, I don't remember what it's called but so there's still bands that are out there that that interest me and and so yeah, yeah. Mark mm -hmm. and Raina do uh, ask me to come back periodically as well um, they're still still going strong at progrock.com yeah, it's been 20 years almost I think that they've been doing their show that's that's yeah. crazy. It is I, like the dividing line is long gone. Um, long gone. RIP. Yeah. yeah. I think delicious agony is still around. They're still out there. I, <laughs> I've got them bookmarked on one of my, yeah. actually they're on my, my tune in app. And when I'm in the car, um, if I'm looking for something to listen to, I'll come across DA or I'll come across, um, Morrow is one that I listen to a lot, um, from France. They, mm -hmm. they do a really good job. Um, there's another one too that that is from way back in the old days. I'm like, God, I still got that book, and it still works. That's crazy. So, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I did my show for ten years, and I I, I <clears throat> agree with you. There were there comes a time where you just get a little little burnout. You need to step away. And when I did yeah. step away, I wasn't sure if it was going to be permanent. I thought it might be, but I thought it might just be maybe I just need to recharge my batteries. Also. I was finding so many bands that I was spending so much money on music. It was just well, ridiculous. that's the other thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody because thinks that you we get were, that mean, you get it yeah, for free, we were, but you don't get it for we free. Were supporting, we were supporting <laughs> these guys, and yeah. there were some that would send you stuff. But yeah. you know, a lot of times it was like, you know you you know especially with piracy and all that, you wanted to spend your money yeah. on their music to to help support them and and let them survive. So. But yeah, it gets expensive, especially when you're on a, a disability pension and <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to live and, and yeah. all that. But trying to go to yeah. shows and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you, gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta yeah. you gotta balance it out. But it was it was fun while it lasted. I had a good time doing doing And now you're work. doing this, which is still kind of related this. in a yeah. way. You're not not necessarily playing the music, but you're still and it's funny, you you talk to people and it's like these are contacts that we created you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, yeah. and some of them are still out there and you can reach out to them and they're more than happy to, to come and talk to you. So that's great. You're doing a great job with this well, thing. By the way. I, I, I must say, have, yeah. I must have 300 Facebook friends that are just from that period, uh, just from the show. Oh, just from absolutely. Show. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the reason I asked you on was obviously to talk Pink Floyd and yeah, what is your Pink Floyd origin story? Where, when did you become aware of Pink Floyd? What was your introduction? It's funny. I was actually thinking about this when I was in little league, <laughs> <laughs> when I was in little league back in 1973, I guess I, that was when dark side of the moon came out mm -hmm. and I can remember, you know, we, everybody's listening to their transistor radios and money is on the air all the time. And my friend's dad was like the commissioner of Little League. And so um, besides playing, we also started umpiring. So you've got these, you know, 11 and 12 year old kids that are umpiring girls softball games and keeping score and all that kind of thing. And I can remember my friend Kathy's dad saying, who in the hell is Pink Floyd or what in the hell is a Pink Floyd or something like that. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, that memory has stuck in my head since 19. 73. So I think that's probably <laughs> my Pink Floyd origin story, which is something you would never expect yeah. to be related to baseball in a way, but, but that's <laughs> kind of where it all started. And then, um, you know, I grew up in a really musical family. People that know me know a little bit about, you know, my, one of my famous relatives and growing up with um, big band and jazz. You can name music, drop, our, Joel. You can name drop. Okay. So my cousin... <laughs> My first cousin is Jimmy Chamberlain, who's the drummer for um, Smashing Pumpkins. His dad was a clarinet player. So we, we'd have these big family gatherings, and it would be my Uncle Bob on the clarinet, my Uncle Chuck playing guitar. A lot of my cousins were drummers and guitar players. So we grew up with all this eclectic um, variety of music. 
And I think that kind of fed into um, what I grew up listening to. You know, I loved, you know, simple, good pop songs. Badfinger, you know, one of my all-time favorite bands. But I still tend to gravitate toward a little bit more um, complex music. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of that's from my upbringing. Uh -huh. so, what, was yeah. your favorite, uh, what was your first Pink Floyd record that you bought? Um, with my own money. Yeah. Or the first one, maybe that's you got for probably birthday or interesting because I, I know I had, um, I had money on 45. I mean, we all did. Um, mm -hmm. the, I just told somebody this the other day, the very first record I bought with money that I actually earned was the grand illusion by sticks. Um, but I think, you know, animals came out right around that time and I had animals on eight track. Um, was my initial, um, you know, exposure to it. So, you know, it, for those of you who don't know about the 8-track version, that had parts one and two of Pigs on a Wing put together with a uh, snowy white guitar solo in the middle of it. And that was, that was my introduction to the Animals album. So that would have been, that would have been right around the time I, I was working, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And then started buying albums or eight tracks. We were buying eight tracks back then because we had eight track players in our cars um, and then started working backwards. So, you know, Wish You Were Here, Dark Side, uh, Metal. And the interesting thing about the Metal eight track was that they had part two of Echoes before part one. <laughs> so I didn't realize until I saw uh, the Live at Pompeii movie at the, at the Midnight movie that echoes so i was listening to echoes in the wrong order like wait a minute the the, the seagulls are in the middle eight tracks were weird man <laughs> oh eight tracks were very God. strange do you still have yeah. those eight tracks i you know what i do still have some of them in wow. this case that's at my parents house um i had a player for a long time and then something happened to it and i tried to fix it and i broke it worse and then i just never got another one but i do still have some of those eight tracks and actually one of them is um a, it was a blank tape that i recorded um an interview with jim ladd and roger waters talking about the wall when it first came out okay and i so i recorded that and i still have that tape somewhere um it's on youtube now i thought actually found it on youtube but um it was uh roger doing a track by track um um explanation of what of what the wall meant in 1979 wow. so but yeah i still have some of those tapes very yeah. cool i yeah i can remember when someone showed me the trick about putting a piece of tape over the little tab and you could record over an eight track and i mm -hmm. my parents mm -hmm. never listened to their eight tracks so i took a bunch of them and recorded yeah. songs off them mostly when we got mtv because my my little sears stereo had an eight track uh player on it and mm -hmm. i put I put a cable coax a coax cable against the back of my stereo and I could get MTV in my stereo. There you go. So I would just mm -hmm. stick a tape in and and hit record and just record a whole eight track of nothing but, you know, music that was being played yeah. on TV. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry yeah. mom and dad. Um but uh you know, you had kids, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> but we're here to talk about animals. We're here to talk about <laughs> talk animals. About yeah, right I got there. it. Right you got it there. back there. Yeah, uh, it's hiding some stuff on my table, but yeah, that's okay. Actually, I have it. Uh, have the have this part of it right here. So, right. so you got the um, lyrics handy. Got the lyrics handy. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to talk about this because it's uh, forty-five years old, and it's coming out with a, a remix that was supposed to come out in twenty eighteen, uh, but it will be um, it will be coming out soon. There was some some problems some disputes over the liner notes that uh, you know roger waters has come out and said that you know he didn't want liner notes because dave david gilmore was saying some things that he did that he didn't do and you know i hate when mom and dad fight yeah, but um, I know. you know and it, it's it's delayed the the release but um, and and roger i love roger i think he's <laughs> one of the most brilliant lyricists ever but man we 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 know we know you were the guy you don't have to continually tell us you were the guy 
And frankly, the fact that he felt he was the guy kind of led to everything that, that happened afterwards. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah, at some point, you just got to let it go. But yeah, Roger commissioned, um, I think his name is Mark Blake. He writes for various magazines. I think he writes for Prague uh, magazine as well. Commissioned him to do liner notes for the album which basically say, you know, that Roger did everything. <laughs> and David was like, ah, nah, we're not going to do that. And, and frankly, we've never included liner notes with any of our releases. So mm -hmm. we're not going to do it. Roger, you know, stomped his foot for a while and they finally came to some sort of an agreement so yeah. yeah the 2008 remix is now coming out in 2022 yeah. 45th anniversary of the album um and as meaningful these days as it was when it came out in 77 absolutely you know, maybe the circumstances have changed a little bit the the main characters have changed a little bit but man the message is just as relevant and maybe even more so yeah. as it was back then yeah i'm yeah. looking forward to the 5.1 surround uh of this album yeah I mean, me too great but yeah i'm probably not going to go with the box set yeah i'm but i'm definitely going to get the blu-ray because yeah. i want to hear <laughs> i want to hear the 5.1 mix for sure yeah. yeah so uh animals came out depending on where you get your information from either January 21st or 23rd of 1977 mm -hmm. on uh, harvest in the UK, which is an EMI uh, affiliate mm -hmm. and Columbia in the U S and yep. the 10th studio album. Uh, it was recorded in a church hall at Britannia row in London that the band had bought <laughs> and turned into a studio. Yes. Uh, Pink yes. Floyd produced this themselves and it was sandwiched between Wish You Were Here and The Wall, which kind of, it, it means that Animals gets a little bit overshadowed by those records. And especially when you come from uh, Dark Side of the Moon to Wish You Were Here to Animals, it's, it's going to take um, a, a lot to get noticed after those two albums. And it wasn't an immediate, it, it wasn't, an, it's not an album that immediately hits you. This is a grower of an album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, you and I know it, the it was released in between, you know, wish you were here and and the wall, but actually it was born at about the same time as Shine on You Crazy Diamond. You know, right. they they finished the the Dark Side tour. Mm -hmm. um, they you know they get back in the studio. They have nothing. You know, they start playing around with wine glasses and rubber bands and stuff, and <laughs> trying to get some inspiration from that. Um, and then into 74, they start putting these songs together and the three that they actually played live on this, uh, miniature French tour in the middle of 74 was shine on you crazy diamond, which, uh, when you go back and listen to that, you can, you can hear it on the, um, expanded, uh, release of, uh, wish you were here that came out a couple years ago. Um, that is very similar to how that ended up um, on release. But then you have these two other songs, Raving and Drooling, um, which would become Sheep. And then um, You Gotta Be Crazy, which which was Dogs. And right. so those are all born at the same time. Um, and then the two songs get shelved because Roger has this idea of this concept around absence and stuff. And so wish you were here comes together. Mm -hmm. They tour that album, they come back and they're like, all right, we've got all this stuff. And, and it's funny. I, I was reading, I, I've had this a long time ago. This is Nick Mason's book. Yeah. Um, Inside out. It's fabulous. It's a fabulous read. And I went back to read, um, the part about when they actually recorded album, um, animals mm -hmm. and there's actually very little information about the recording of animals because it came together very quickly. And, you know, mm -hmm. the songs, half the songs were already put together. Um, you know, Roger comes up with the, the concept, um, around, um, animal farm, um, divides humanity humanity into these three groups mm -hmm. and rather than this anti-soviet thing which the original uh, story was about 
um, of Animal Farm. It's this big rant about capitalism and growing Thatcherism in England and, and um, you know, the rich getting richer, the poor just getting trampled on. And yeah. um, so that's, that, that's how it all came together. But uh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it, and part of the reason that it came together quickly is Roger did so much of the work. Richard Wright was going through a divorce. Uh, David Gilmore had just had his first child, so they weren't around as much. Yeah, yeah, and but you know, I have to wonder about the narrative about that because Roger likes to say, you know, these guys weren't contributing. Um, you know, I had to do all the heavy lifting, but then within a year of of animals release david's got a solo album richard's got a solo album <laughs> mm-hmm. so they obviously had been writing they obviously had material it's just roger was was taking over yeah and i, I actually read an interview uh preparing for the show tonight um I was reading some old interviews and stuff and you know roger roger said you know i i I felt it was important to sing my own songs. Um, you know, I had the ideas. I, I wrote all the lyrics. I, you know, did all this stuff. And and so he was, you know, at that point, he was really kind of taking over things. Yeah. And the other guys were feeling left out. So they are like... Mm-hmm. Definitely yeah. led to some tension in the band going yeah. forward. And, yeah. and, I, yeah. and I read a quote from Roger where he said, what am I going to wait for lyrics from rick and and dave they're not going to write better lyrics than me <laughs> no and and david gilmore would be the first one to admit it too yeah and dave um, takes a long time to write lyrics mm-hmm. yeah or, or songs in general um right. and rick said that it was the it he said it was the period when roger really began to believe he was the sole writer of the band mm-hmm. and rick said it was partly my fault because i didn't have much to offer dave who did have something to offer only managed to get a he said a couple of songs on there but it was only yeah one uh, Dave said that he didn't feel like he was being squeezed out at that time. No. Um, and he, he also mentioned about Roger's, ly- Roger's lyrics that he didn't disagree with anything he was writing. You know, he didn't, he didn't offer a different right. He kind of felt the same way as Roger did. Mm-hmm. He wished he could express it, you know, lyrically and verbally as well as Roger did, but he knew that he that wasn't part of of his talent. Dave spoke spoke through his guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, For sure. But the thing, you know, the thing about you know that's the first album that that Richard Wright didn't have a, um, a writing credit on. Frankly, he should have. Yeah. Because he composed that whole opening to Sheep um, when all the tension was going on. He was going in the studio at night by himself, and he composed that whole Fender Rhodes intro to Sheep. Mm-hmm with nobody else in the studio and yet Roger didn't give him writing credit. That's and when you notes. listen <laughs> I know. And when you listen to Raving and Drooling and how that morphed into Sheep, it's it's I mean Raving and Drooling drooling is basically just it's just this continual bass riff that kind of runs through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Rick's keyboards on that just really makes the whole song and it's a shame he never got a writing credit for it because he really should have yeah of course it's got the iconic album cover um which was roger's idea too uh storm georgerson uh brought his concept to life uh with the pig flying over battersea uh power station you'll notice that i've got my australian pink floyd shirt there you go uh, yeah um, uh it's got the kangaroo over battersea power station which is cool um just Amazing, great story. Obviously, that the pig escaped and uh, landed in a <laughs> farmer's field. <laughs> yep, yep. And that they had sharpshooters on hand to. They uh, did. Yeah, they were re- they were ready, and yet it still still got away. And so. in the end, they used preliminary shots that they took cook of the power station, and they they flew the pig in, um, which is yeah. really what they wanted to do in the first pre pre Photoshop. Even yeah. you know that's that's when you had to you know cut those negatives and yeah put all that stuff together i'm so amazed uh, by album art that came out i know pre-computer age (laughs) yeah you know it's funny my daughter my 12 year old daughter is getting into vinyl now and i mean you know growing up part of the whole experience of listening to an album was putting on on a turd table turning it on 
sitting there with, with the album cover and reading the liner notes. And she, one of the first albums she got, I'm like, you know, I give it to, and she, I got a picture of her. She's sitting on the couch with her face buried in the liner notes. I'm like, she gets it. Yeah. I'm winning at parenting. <laughs> You're yeah. doing it right. You're doing, doing it right. It this, right. Yeah. this album went to number two in the UK and number three in the United States. It's, for me, it's the ultimate grower Pink Floyd album. People didn't know what to make of it on first listen. It, it's very much denser than the previous two records. Yeah, uh, it's a totally different sound. It's yeah. it's angry. It's um, it's it's. It, I, I saw it referred to as Punk Floyd, and yeah, you know, I've it seen comes that. Out yeah. in Seventy-seven. <laughs> you know, the punk rock is taking over. You know, they're tired of these dinosaur bands, and yet Pink Floyd rocks on this one. They mm -hmm. really do. I mean, it's it's a rocker. Um, it's not uh, your ambient uh, stoner album like the previous, you know, two or three or Adam Hart Mother was kind of out there as well. Mm -hmm. um, this this was this was some foot tapping, playing drums on the dashboard kind of mm -hmm. lis listen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And angry. It very was... Roger. Angry Roger. Angry Roger. Very. Yeah. He's starting to turn toward political themes, which he would only magnify as his career went on he is um he brought in pigs on the wing parts one and two uh, because this was such a dark angry album it needed some kind of hope and light to it so a little hoping yeah yeah so he so he it. writes a love song he writes a love he song writes a love song life. for his, yeah. his girl at the time and, and he splits it up into the beginning song and the ending song it was just a couple verses him on the acoustic guitar and it's another bone of contention because now he gets more writing credits on the record because they split the up split it in half yeah because the royalties are divided by the number of writing credits so mm -hmm. you've got this one song and now becomes two songs and um yeah the ironic thing about that song though you know that you got this whole album that's like this anti-capitalist rant you know and about English society and all this stuff. And yet, what does Roger do? He divorces his high school sweetheart and he marries into the British aristocracy yeah. <laughs> with his second wife, Carolyn, who the whole Pigs on the Wing is written about. But uh, Who he little, met while she little was bit married. Of <laughs> married to the Grateful Dead's manager, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Um, so yeah, so we, we've got the lineup, obviously it's David Gilmore on lead vocals for dogs, partly on lead vocals for dogs, lead guitar on the, uh, the three, uh, animals in the middle, you know, dogs, sheep and pigs, three different mm -hmm. ones. He plays bass on, um, pigs, three different ones and sheep. That's something that a lot of people don't know. Yep. And, um, I was again. I was reading some interviews with David about uh, that were done in like the early '90s. Um, would have been between between momentary lapse and and the division bell. He was mm -hmm. getting um, interviewed, and the interviewer was asking him about you know Roger's bass playing. Was Roger a good bass player? And David was like, oh, "No, <laughs> he's <laughs> really not." As a matter of fact. You know, I played the majority of bass on all on on all the albums because mm -hmm. it was it was faster recording. Um, Roger just he said Roger just never showed an interest in in becoming a better bass player. So, uh, in fact, he made a crack about um, you know when Roger would win some readers poll about you know best bass player, Roger would say uh, thanks, Dave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um. But yeah, that's something a lot of people don't know is that mm -hmm. Roger actually did not play bass on a lot of the uh, recorded output yeah. um, from the band. Yeah, Dave also uh, did the talk box on Pigs, three different ones. Uh, mm -hmm. Roger Roger did all the lead vocals except for a small part of Dogs. He mm -hmm. did uh, backing vocals, acoustic guitar on Pigs on the Wing, parts one and two, rhythm guitar on uh, Sheep three different or pigs three different ones and sheep mm -hmm. uh played he did play bass on dogs uh he did tape effects yes uh and vocorder mm -hmm. 
Nick Mason drums, percussion, tape effects. Uh, there was no no yeah. drums on the the pigs on the wing uh, parts one uh -huh. and two. Uh, and Richard Wright, uh, Hammond organ, ARP string synthesizer, Fender Rhodes, Mini Moog, uh, Farfisa organ, piano, clavinet, EMS VCS three, and harmony vocals. Yeah. So basically, Richard played yeah. every keyboard he had. <laughs> he did, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and. Um... Yeah, when you go when you go back to listen to um, you got to be crazy. Um, first of all, I, I was playing it for my daughter today. She loves dogs. Dogs is probably my favorite Pink Floyd song. I, I flip flop between that and Echoes, but Dogs is it's always my go to when I want to listen to some Pink Floyd. I throw on Side One of Animals, and that's my go to. Um, but um, I forgot what my point was about all of that. <laughs> but, um, oh, about You Gotta Be Crazy. Um, lyrically, it's, it's different. Um, it was very, very wordy when it started out. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dave was like, I don't know how he could catch his breath saying all the lines. So they cut out like 80% of the lyrics. Um, but as far as David and Roger sharing vocals, um, they did in the early version as well and then rick adds um harmony during during the outro um mm -hmm. part yeah. um so that's that's very similar but um the the original version you got to be crazy the end is more kind of a call and answer you mm -hmm. know who was born in a house full of pain born in a uh, mm -hmm. which i guess it still <laughs> is on it but more more pronounced the the background were more um, up front, and you can hear Dave and, and Richard um, singing more together. Yeah. But yeah, it sucks that he didn't get that uh, writing credit for his Fender Rhodes playing on sheet because yeah. it makes the whole song. It really does. Yeah. yeah. So, "Pigs on the Wing" Part One, I imagine, was a very interesting song for for Pink Floyd fans that had just come off of "Wish You Were Here" and mm -hmm. "Dark Side of the Moon" to hear this. Little acoustic ditty that's a minute and a half long. I must have been going yeah. like, "What has gone wrong what with Pink this? Floyd? <laughs> what is this?" Yeah. yeah. But then you get then, a, then you right get a seventeen minute dogs. epic right after it. Seventeen Absolutely. minutes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And a great song lyrically. It's a great song. Um, you know, to put it into the whole um, animal farm theme. You know, the dogs are kind of the enforcers. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're the enablers of the pigs. Um, and there's there's some really biting uh, lyrics in there from For Roger. Sure. It's, yeah. yeah. Epic centerpiece of the album about mm -hmm. society's predators. Uh, Gilmore, yeah. Gilmore gets a writing credit here along with Waters. His only mm -hmm. lead vocal on the album, but they both sing on this song. And yeah. It you know of course when it was you've got to be crazy it had been previously performed live there's there's some great bootlegs out there with it uh, mm -hmm. that you can find oh yeah I had one on vinyl back <laughs> back in the day I mean you were able to to find quite a bit of them and sound and good sounding ones too yeah um, yeah but the, and then wish you were here comes out and it's like oh what happened to these other songs well then we got to wait two more years to to hear them they let them ferment mm -hmm. and grow and 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 together which is how they did things back in that yeah. in the day though i mean even dark side they were playing for a year uh, before they even recorded it so that was kind of their mo back then was to write new material go out and perform it knock it into shape and then and then come back and and record it yeah so. and it's it's really interesting when you you listen to this album and you can hear when the seeds of this were born because there's i mean richard's uh synth work harkens back to wish you were here in this song mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and of course it's got some iconic gilmore guitar work with his double lead lines it's really some of his best guitar work i mean it, it probably doesn't get all the attention that it deserves i mean when you've got comfortably numb and, and all this other stuff that he did it's very easy to overlook dogs but man he's on fire in that song he, he really sure is. is it's just really really good guitar work in there and dogs barking through vocorders on this mm -hmm. <laughs> um and and i think he plays his telly on on a lot of that he's not playing the strat on some of that i think a lot of that's from his telecaster 
Okay. Which is a little bit of a different sound. Um, but uh, yeah, it kind of fits in with the, the mood of the song, though, know, too. A little more biting guitar mm -hmm. instead of the more melodic, um, you know, psychedelic stuff that we're used to from the Strat. Yeah, his his double lead line there, that... The... Yeah, that is which um, which was you know doubled by Snowy White when yeah. they when they played it live. But it's, yeah, it's very angular sounding for David Gilmore. Um, mm -hmm. This this whole album too, I think, is it's angry and it's dark. I think it's not just about uh, capitalism and the repressive English government and um, people like Mary Whitehouse and that kind of thing. It's also <laughs> I think it's also a statement about punk rock and the punk rock movement because, you know, they were kind of a favorite punching bag of the Sex Pistols mm -hmm. who had just come out with mm -hmm. their album the previous November. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, you know what, there's, there's something to this anger that's good, but we're going to just do it our way. And, and that's where the punk Floyd comes in. It's like they're, they're, they're mm -hmm. exploring darker themes they're exploring political themes. It's angry. And yet they're still, I mean, all three of the, the main songs on this are all well beyond uh, radio friendly time for, you know, time, uh, right. amount of time, you know. <laughs> yeah. The, the, no singles. From, That's right. From, from you can't play it on the radio. <laughs> the, I, I was thinking about this um, a couple of days ago too, the whole punk Floyd aspect of it, you know, punk rock you know four chords and the truth and when you listen to dogs dogs is really just this four chord chord progression that kind of repeats through the whole song so in a way dogs is also four chords and the truth yeah. you know outside of that middle part it's just this this four four chord chord progression that kind of repeats through the whole song mm. um very very punk yeah really when you think about it you know and the the production is masterful on this too because uh, yeah. you've got that that cool the line uh, you know dragged down by the stone that gets repeated and repeated and looped and mm -hmm. looped and then it kind of dissolves into this, this animalistic sound at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, the organ the yeah. organ kicks in, you know, and uh, um, you know it's funny. I'm I'm working at a at a jazz club in Chicago now. I work the door on Friday nights and they actually have two Hammond V3s in this jazz club. They have one up behind the bar that this guy plays a couple mm -hmm. nights a week. And they got another one on stage. It's just part of the equipment that they have there. And this one guy that plays it, man, uh, the sounds that can come out of that V3, um, it's, it's, it's quite shocking sometimes, you know? <laughs> And so it fits it fits in right right with that, that ending part of, of dogs. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So side two kicks off with pigs, three different ones. And mm -hmm. some really cool little intricate bass parts early in this song by Dave. By that, David, yeah. 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 And and, yeah. and af, you know, right after the sampled pig noise uh, over Richard's sort of uh, Twilight Zone ish keyboard riff, that. And, you know, I think, I think mostly when I listen to Pink Floyd, I, I prefer David's vocals. I don't know that I would call Roger a great vocalist. He's a serviceable no. vocalist, he's very got a very distinctive voice. He's great for sarcasm and and bitter lyrics. Mm -hmm. it fits his voice mm -hmm. perfectly. Yeah. But my favorite singing on this album is is Roger on Pig's three different ones. Oh yeah, because he's just spitting the lyrics out. Yeah. You know, it's just with such venom and disdain um, for the the subject of his ire. Yes. <laughs> you know, he's. He, He's he he is it's the he's the perfect vocalist um, for that song, that absolutely. Whole, ha ha, Sherrod, you are, mm -hmm. and uh, you're nearly a laugh, but you're really a cry. It's just fantastic. I mean, he's it really is. And when you see some of the more recent performances of that and how he's kind of reinterpreted that whole song, it became this huge anti-Trump rant 
um, with all the video and everything. And, and actually my favorite um, video that I've seen um, was him performing in front of like 300,000 people in Mexico City back in like 2016 or something like that. And again, it's the beginning of, of Trump and, um, and to hear him kind of aim his, his ire toward what's happening in this country and, and the cult of personality that's Donald Trump mm -hmm. and, um, to, to interpret that song, you know, to him, um, was, was very, very, um, Prescient, I guess, is kind of the word yeah. I'm thinking of, or maybe something else. But um, yeah, it, it 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 hit it hit its mark. Yeah, you know, yeah. And um, if you're planning to see Roger on his "This Is Not a Drill" tour, don't think he's going to leave politics at home. <laughs> you know, it's kind of um, a myth, I guess, that Roger became political during animals or that in recent years, because when you go back and listen to even some of the lyrics in us and them, or you go back to saucer full of secrets and, and corporal Clegg from, from saucer full of secrets. Yeah. This is very anti-war message. Always been anti-war putting out there. Yeah. Um, always been anti-war. Yeah. Um, his father was killed in world war two when he was four months old. Um, his dad, both his mom and dad were teachers, but, um, his dad was a member of the communist party. He, um, you know, so he grew up with very extreme left-wing, um, political leanings, mm -hmm. um, as it is. So, I mean, to think that, um, you know, he's all, all of a sudden political he, Roger was always, always political. You just yeah. had to, had to, had to listen. You just had to listen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He started to bring it out more and more often though, I think from this point on, with animals, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's more in your face. Definitely it, yeah. more in your he, face. He got, his, yeah. he got his hands, he really sunk his teeth into the animal farm uh, mm -hmm. imagery. And um, and then when it was accepted and it did well, it's like, hey, I, now I can, now I got carte blanche. I can, <laughs> I can mm -hmm. do all this stuff all the time. And yeah, you're right. He's always been vehemently anti war. I mean, understandable given, you know, his upbringing and mm -hmm. uh, you know basically living his whole life without a father and that that obviously sunk into his lyrics for the wall as well and mm -hmm. the whole and the whole story of that uh you know concept album yeah. and um yeah i mean it's he is who he is but you're you're uh, my point is you're if you go see his show <laughs> he's not leaving those politics at home it's going to be no. on the, it's going to be on the screen no. it's going to be in the yeah. things he says and in the in the songs themselves so mm -hmm. yeah and he's actually performing sheep on this tour which he hadn't done uh before so there's there's some good messaging um at the beginning of that song as well mm -hmm. um but it's it's good to hear he's actually not playing bass on sheep in case <laughs> anybody was wondering um but um yeah yeah he's out there He's out there. He's just in Chicago like a week ago. Yeah. I am not yeah. surprised that he's playing sheep because I don't think there's been a time in this country, in this country where sheep has been more applicable uh, in so many ways. So, yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, when, when we talked about doing this, I, I was on vacation a couple of weeks ago. I actually bought another copy of animal farm to read while I was gone. Cause okay. I hadn't read it um in you know since i was in grade school probably so i actually read reread animal farm while i was on vacation i'm like man these sheep and how the pigs um you know and again it starts off with this whole soviet message but mm -hmm. um how the pigs um try to lure you into oh we're all in this together you know we're we're you know we're all equal we're all and then as time goes on, you know, they, they train the dogs to be their enforcers. And yet the sheep are always there to repeat the message, you mm -hmm. know, two, you know, four legs, good, two legs, bad, yeah. four legs, good, two legs, bad. And then at the end, the, the pigs are walking upright and it's four legs, good, two legs are better, yeah. you know, and, and then that's how they, you, you see it now in the, in the, the right wing of this country, how all these people, it doesn't matter what they do, 
you know, in Animal Farm, the pigs kill the beloved um, uh, horse and, and all this stuff. And yet the sheep are always there to to be the apologists for the pigs and to say, we're with you. We're, we're behind you. We're there. And, you know, uh, the election happened last night in various parts of this country. And Liz Cheney, who's on the on the uh, the commission that's um, the January, January 6th, 6th commission yeah. gets gets voted out because she stood up for democracy, you know, and you can <laughs> say what you want about the Cheney family. I mean, you know, her dad is probably a war criminal. You know, these are not good people, but yet somehow she tried to stand up for what's right and, and is punished for it because the sheep, you know, two legs better can't be in the middle you can't <laughs> yeah you can't be moderate yeah. anymore there's no moderate yeah no <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh yeah it's funny because my my daughter just uh had that in school last year and so i i actually basically reread re the whole thing uh, to to give her you know some advice on on her writing her paper and that kind of thing and i was like wow mm -hmm. i haven't i haven't read this in forever and if, in fact it's funny because I think I just Googled it and some, there was a PDF of it online. I just read it online. <laughs> yeah. And been like, yeah. Oh yeah. I remember this. I remember this. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah. Really and to think that he wrote, he wrote animal farm in 1984 within like just a couple of years of each other. Yeah. And it's like, Oh my God, it's all, it's all coming true. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So pigs, three different ones and sheep, as I mentioned, both of them are over 10 minutes long sheep previously known as raving and drooling and, raving and performed drooling. Yeah. prior to the album and and mm -hmm. richard you mentioned it i've got it in my notes he opens the song with an electrical an electric piano part over the sound of the chirping it's birds. fabulous i mean it's just some of his best keyboard work yeah. just so creative and like i said it, it really makes that whole song it just really gives it a whole nother dimension from where it started and to think that Roger didn't appreciate that enough to to give him a writing credit, um, you know, and it's a shame because that kind of that's kind of really, and they had issues during which you were here too, but that's really kind of the beginning of the end of the band. Yeah, and Roger just just decimating the cons the confidence of of Richard and Nick as well, because yeah. they're, you know, Nick didn't play all the drums on the wall either. You know, Roger mm -hmm. was bringing people in um, and just destroyed their confidence. And um, I was reading another another interview with David um, about, you know, doing a uh, momentary lapse of reason. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, Richard didn't think he could play anymore. And Nick didn't think he could play anymore. And I had to build these guys back up again. And, you know, for the album, he brought in other people for Momentary Lapse, uh, brought in other people. But when they yeah. went on the road and toured and were playing it live, the, they realized that they could still do it. And yeah. you hear it in what came next. But, yeah, it's a shame that um, Roger's ego or whatever just got in the way and just really tore these guys down and yeah. made them think that they weren't contributing or didn't have anything to give. and. And that intro to Sheep is a grand example of of what Richard brought to the table. Yeah. I went, um, my first time seeing the band was that Momentary Lapse tour. And I can tell you that... Uh, I got to show you something. Nick did it. <laughs> Look at that. I have that. I actually still tour, have that. That's the tour program. In fact, I wonder Momentary if I have Lapse. that. I actually... Um, uh, so, and actually, so look at this. I've got my my tickets. <laughs> my tickets are in there. Oh, too. your tickets so, are in there. That's great. Yeah, I got my ticket stubs in there. Yeah. So uh, I have my ticket stubs, but it's not in here. It's not in here. Too. Yeah. 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 That was that was a great show. Look at Dave with show, hair. But look at, let's see Dave, Dave with, with hair. hair. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It's weird that I just happen to have that. Uh, I actually didn't <laughs> think about that. It just happened to be in this like bookcase over here, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I didn't see any trouble uh, that Nick had on that tour, and and I I talked I had Carmine a piece on the show, and he he talked about you know being flown in to to play on Dogs of War because Nick was just kind of getting his his groove back, and he wasn't ready, mm -hmm. to, and they wanted somebody that was a little bit harder hitter for that particular song. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was that was pretty cool. But um, yeah, it, it's 
I always wonder, you know, because, you know, what these guys do in the studio, like most of the guys who get credit for writing songs, if they're not the drummer, they didn't write the drum parts. You mean like Roger didn't write the drum I, parts? No, I mean, I mean most or, bands, like most bands where like the lead singer or the lead guitarist or whoever writes the song, they get song credit. Mm -hmm. they, they're yeah. not drummers. They didn't write the drum parts mostly. Right. You know, it, there are exceptions. Yeah. But um, Richard yeah. writes clearly writes that intro and doesn't get a mm -hmm. writing credit. I mean, how you know what are we supposed to think that that Roger came up with that because he there's no <laughs> way. <laughs> there, uh, somebody they uh, an interviewer asked David Gilmore if uh, it, kind of jokingly if Roger played the fretless bass on "Hey You," <laughs> and uh, Dave was like, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> Is kind of his response. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and and again, it it it's a shame that they weren't more collaborative at that point, and and Roger wasn't more uh, generous in recognizing what the other guys brought to the table. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, and it goes to his ego that you know he was the guy. And again, I I love Roger. I Pink Floyd. You know, wouldn't have been what they were without him mm -hmm. although i have to say um uh, the division bell is probably one of my favorite floyd albums and i know a lot of people like to talk about polly but polly is a heck of a writer and if anybody knows what's in david's head you know it's probably his wife and yeah. and i love i love that album i do too but, but yeah i mean earlier stuff i mean roger <laughs> was the the visionary you know, yeah. Um, but they wouldn't have been what they were without the other three guys. So yeah. it's a shame he maybe didn't recognize it at the time. Yeah, and and, and let egos get in the way of. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not gonna like for somebody that you know was the the son of a communist and has always felt uncomfortable with his wealth, and uh, supposedly. To not let Richard have that writing credit is just seems yeah, it's, very it's, petty. It's, it's petty. It is petty. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Lyrically, this is brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. sheep, Absolutely. It, the, the sheep rise up and kill the dogs. And yet um, they remain as sheep because the, the, the line is, have you heard the news? The dogs are dead. You better stay home and do as you're told. Yeah. Get um, out of the road if you want to grow old. Yeah. yeah. Uh and yeah. then the the dark twist on the 23rd psalm here is uh, uh he converted yes. me to lamb chops and all of that part. Uh, it's Yeah, and and it, it's funny when you read it, but I mean it's, you know, you there was there was a a um uh cartoon that I saw toward, toward the beginning of the uh Trump administration or Maybe it was in, in the lead up to that. And it was um, something, it was all these sheep, you know, and on the billboard was a wolf. And, and it's basically says, you know, I will eat you or something like that. And the sheep are talking is like, well, he tells it like it is, you know, and it's <laughs> like, did you not, did you not expect him to, to eat you alive? Did you not expect the wolves or the pigs in this case? to eat you alive, you know, he, you know, you can say a lot of things about Trump, but he, he did a lot of exactly what he said he was going to do. A lot of people didn't mm. believe he was going to do it, but, but he did. Um, and it kind of, unfortunately it kind of brought out, you know, kind of the dark side of what America has, has been all about since it's founding, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're kind of coming to grips with that, but then there's a whole segment that, doesn't think we should teach that bit of yeah. our history because it makes us look less than what we like to believe we are. You know? <laughs> it's the uh, it's the equivalent of John Oliver going, moving on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I'm I'm saying that's that's what that's where we're at right now. With you know, yeah. we don't want to we don't want to talk about it. Let's just move on. Yeah. Um, but which yeah. is why it's so great to see this album still being played live by Roger and seeing, like I said, this message that, you know, maybe had meaning in 1976 when it was written, but yet it still has meaning. You know, the, mm -hmm. the more we change, the more we stay the same. 
um, if we don't, you know, learn the lessons of history, we're bound to repeat them. And, and all those things continually come true because the sheep don't rise up, yeah. you know, or, or, you know, the pigs have their dog enforcers yeah. and have us, have us frightened to believe that, you know, uh, I don't deserve a living wage because, um, you know, the company should be able to make all this money and, you should be thankful you have a job, even though you need to work three jobs to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we still see car plants in the South that have a chance to unionize and make more money and provide a better living for themselves. Believe what they're being told that if you do that, you know, we're gonna go away, despite billions of dollars of investments in mm -hmm. infrastructure and whatnot to actually build cars there. They're not going to walk away. They just don't want to pay you more money. And yet you believe, you believe it. Yeah. You know, well, that's, I, that's, live, I that's... will live in poverty <laughs> for the sake of these billionaires so that they can yeah. continue to be billionaires. And it's the sheep, man. It's, Once it's, they, it's, even, it's, it's even shame. after they get rid of the dogs, they're still sheep. They still do they're what still they're sheep. Told. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, brilliant album um, from start to finish musically. Like I said, it, it doesn't always hit you right away, these these songs, but there are cool little grooves. There are mm -hmm. there are bluesy sections. There are jazz. Pigs has sections. a great groove. Pigs has a great groove. I mean you could you could you could dance to, yeah. you could dance to pigs. Pigs is catchy. Part, For it a really long is. song, it's really yeah, catchy. It's, it really is. Yeah. It's got it's got great hook. It's probably the best hooks on the album mm -hmm. are in are in pigs, yeah. three different ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah uh, I have a but, I have uh, a sore spot with pigs three different ones in that um one of my great tragedies of my college career was when I was writing for the paper we had to do you know you, you get you got your desk and I was on the sports desk and I'm doing a sports writing but you have to do to get your grade you have to get uh stories from some of the other desks and I got to cover a um a gig from a band that did covers mostly pink floyd covers the band was called harvest and so I go to this club and I'm covering it and I'm interviewing the band and I'm, I'm talking about it and I'm reviewing this show. And it was a really good show. They also did like some grand funk and some other stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about pigs, three different ones. And I write it the way it is pigs and then parentheses, three different ones. And a copy editor changed the name of the song to three different pigs. <laughs> thinking that that was correct English. Um, and I'm like, yeah. and I couldn't use it as a clip, like, um, in mm -hmm. my portfolio. And I was so upset. Yeah. About that. yeah. Editors. <laughs> yeah. Now, now we just don't have editors. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people post stuff online and nobody goes through it. And well, like, you know, word and Chrome will tell you if a, a word is misspelled or if you need a comma. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's why I was thinking uh, on the third, the third section of pigs where he talks about Mary Whitehouse and a lot of people might not know who she was. She was mm -hmm. this morality crusader in the UK. Tipper Gore before Tipper Gore. I was going to, that's exactly what I was going to say. Who could we equate her to? And I was thinking, you know, people like Phyllis Shafley or somebody like that, you know, but no, Tipper Gore is probably the closest American comp to who Mary Whitehouse was. Um, very, you know, you know, I like the way Roger described the t quintessential British, you know, stiff upper lip, mm -hmm. um, you know, but yeah, this, this is, this is immoral. This should not be on TV. This is whatever. And, and Roger's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I remember before I had this on, um, and if it, as an official release, I had recorded it off a friend on a cassette and I, I always thought White House was a referral to our government at the time. Well, it is now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you go see the show, if you go see Roger now, that's that's exactly what it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, Mary White, White House was a was a real person um, in nineteen seventies England who was telling people how they should live and what mm -hmm. what your moral values should be. What was and, offensive uh, and what wasn't? What was yeah. Mm -hmm what was acceptable yeah. for public consumption. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the album closes with pigs on the wing part two, the, the two bookends. A ray of hope. Yeah. Ray not of part of the concept, but um, no. 
more to do with Roger's personal life. A nice contrast mm-hmm. between the the dark mood of the three middle songs and the the two uh, bookends. Um, yeah, and it 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 like you said like you said it it opens and closes the album with a little bit of hope and that nice little acoustic guitar and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe I've actually played that at, at some a couple of open mics. <laughs> I, I play. I actually bookended my my open mic set with parts one and two of uh, of Pigs on. It. It's easy to play. It's it's mm-hmm. it's it, it, the the G well, Roger major played it. So sound. yeah, it's if Roger easy. can play it, I can play it. Um, but yeah, it it kind of brings a ray of hope and optimism to to this really dark, angry album. It's a good way to close. Yeah. yeah. I remember the first time I met you was at Cal Prague at the first Cal Prague festival. <laughs> and I remember after the show, we were hanging out at the hotel. We were singing monkey songs with Mike Keneally by the pool. Yeah. <laughs> our buddy, our buddy Duke brought his and guitar. Duke, yep. Yeah. And you grabbed his guitar and you started, you started playing dogs. I remember that. I could, I, yeah, but I, I didn't know how to play guitar then. But yeah, like I said, it's four, <laughs> four chords in the truth. You know, I think a D minor, I think it's in, but um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Good times. So Good times indeed. You, you, do you rank Animals as your, your top Pink Floyd album? You said it was um, your go-to when you, when you want to hear some Floyd you know side what? one. If if I if I went strictly by number of plays, um, I tend to gravitate toward animals more than I would say. Animals, wish you were here, and 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 um, the division bell are probably you know, dark side of the moon. You have to say I'm going to listen to this whole thing you can't listen to just parts of dark side of the moon yeah um you have that you have to listen to that um wish you were here you know you could you could get by on you know the first half of shine on you crazy diamond and 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 um and whatnot but but animals yeah i i mean dogs is that's like a whole meal you know, you could listen to side one and be completely satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. I only need so, what, 18 and a half minutes to get through side one. 18 and a half minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. 45 years old, this album. It really it, is. Yeah. I can't believe that. Yeah. Came out when I was 15. Yeah. Um, so do the math. <laughs> do the math now. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. You're, you mm-hmm. already told us your age, so you don't even have to yeah. do the math. <laughs> I know. Oh man, so yeah, I'm so glad we got to talk about this album. I've been uh, wanting to do a Pink Floyd show for a while, and it's um, you know, I, I could talk about easily half a dozen Pink Floyd albums uh, with mm-hmm. very little preparation, including this one. Um, probably my favorite is "Wish You Were Here" because it's it's not as dark um yeah it is, it's it is a lonely it's, and it's album. so good yeah it's so good i mean shine on your crazy diamond is just so good that's it's, it's brilliant absolutely brilliant that whole thing just being a a a reminder of the significant shadow that sid barrett cast over the band mm-hmm. and his absence cast over the band um and his reappearance while they were recording yeah it, it just yeah, it that just, was yeah it gives that album for me a, a, a magic that none of the other albums have as good as they are. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty happy they got to talk to, about Pink Floyd and, it, and I could not have talked uh, coherently about Amagama or Foster <laughs> Full of Secrets <laughs> or some of the others, but uh uh, and some of them I own. It's just that I don't. They don't get a lot of spins because they are very much an acquired taste. That's mm-hmm. I, I did not acquire. <laughs> yeah, some of that stuff is actually better um, when it's done by other bands. Like uh, Cymbaline is a is a great example from the Moore album. Yeah. Um, RPWL does a cover of Cymbaline, and it's amazing. And they actually incorporate some of the jam from Adam Hart Mother into that too. So. Yes. Um, there's been some um, really good covers. I mean, we could do a whole nother show 
we could do a whole <laughs> series on Pink Floyd covers. Yeah. Um, but um, I yeah, just this got was it. fun. This I was just great. got a covers album. I did. I had Mary Fall on the show a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I love her. She she did, sent um, me this Dark Side of the Moon cover. She, I was going to say she in did 5. Dark Side 1. of the Moon in its entirety, and it, it and it's really really good. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was happy to see that you had her on because she was one of those people that I used to play on the show back in the day. We we would play some October Project yeah, stuff, and they were that. more. They were more, um, more chamber prog. You know, I am the morning is a great band out of Russia these days, mm-hmm, and they're mm-hmm. kind of called, called chamber prog. Yeah, and and uh, October Project would find genre wise would probably fit in really well. But Mary's amazing. She's got a very unique voice. Yeah, um, very just haunting. tremendous, a tremendous singer. And yeah, she did um, Dark Side of the Moon a few years ago, and it's it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. We got done talking, um, and I, I stopped recording, and she, she asked me if I had it, and I, I said, no. She goes, oh, you got to hear it in 5.1. I'll send it to you. <laughs> you she goes, go. give me your mailing address. I'll send it to you. She, she goes, I'm not going to – she goes, I'm not gonna, she, goes I, she had just gotten done doing pre-orders for her new album. She goes, I'm mm-hmm. not going to sign it, but I'm going to throw it in, the, in an envelope and get it to you. And literally, I think three days after I emailed her, I got it in the mail. I was like, wow, that – that was fast and yeah and she's in and I was constantly like, she's constantly playing live too i follow yeah. her on facebook i have for a long time yeah. and um she's she's out there all the time she's <laughs> played in chicago um not that long ago but yeah, she, yeah she's great if you like pink yeah. floyd grab uh grab mary falls uh, <laughs> dark side of the moon it's called yes. From the dark side of the moon and this surround sound mix uh was mixed by bob clear mountain Who's oh, one. okay. He's worked yeah, with he the biggest big time brightest. in the eighties. Yeah, he was with everybody. Yeah, he's done some really iconic albums. So, um, mm-hmm. so yep. uh, they did a great job on the surround on that. So, I, I I can't speak highly enough for that. But Joel, thank you so yeah. much for your time and yeah, helping for me. me. This was fun. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to unpack animals and forty five years of that, and I'm sure we'll 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 talk about Pink Floyd again soon. But it's been a lot of fun having you on. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you.